Respiration is a lot more complex than just thinking about our lungs because the big job of respiration is to bring in oxygen and let go of carbon dioxide, but then what happens to the oxygen that comes in and where does the carbon dioxide come out is that we have this whole kind of two-part process of respiration that is the breathing part and then the cellular part. And so we have to think about both of them. So cellular respiration, if you took Bio 111, you went into some nice detail about it, essentially means that you are using oxygen to help more efficiently break down your food sources at the cellular level. Breathing, the whole process of the lungs, getting the oxygen, extracting oxygen, diffusing into the blood, and carbon dioxide diffusing out. So we're gonna talk just a little bit about cellular respiration. And I know we talked a bit about this when we went over evolution and the more efficient process of breaking down our food with oxygen. So we need a supply of oxygen for cellular respiration. The waste product, one, one of the waste products of cellular respiration is carbon dioxide. So there's a constant need to get that in and out. These are mitochondria. These are the organelles that process the oxygen in food to pump out more efficient sources of energy, ATP, and as a waste product, carbon dioxide. So cellular respiration, we need to constantly have a supply of energy to our cells. So if someone stops breathing, this is the major point of doing CPR on them, is to keep pumping the air into the body so you get regular supply of oxygen to all of the tissues. It's going to be most important for things like the heart and the brain. Those are the two biggest things that are gonna help you to keep those cells alive. So nutrients, we often talk about glucose in terms of cellular respiration, but all of your energy sources that you consume in your food are going to funnel into the process of cellular respiration somewhere. There are other metabolic pathways that like your fats and your complex carbohydrates and your proteins, they get broken down and then they funnel into cellular respiration somewhere. So I know glucose, one of the hard things about like Bio 111 is glucose is kind of like a placeholder for the term food. Make more efficient little bits of energy called ATP in that process. So let's go to the second part, breathing. Breathing is a process of extracting oxygen from air. That oxygen is going to go into your lungs. Your lungs, we're gonna look at the smallest parts of the respiratory system, which are the alveoli, and these are sacs that are going to have the room for car carbon dioxide to come out of the blood and oxygen to go into the blood. And so that these little air sacs inside your lung, these tiny microscopic air sacs, are covered in circulatory vessels. Again, remembering that all of these systems have a very high reliance on the circulatory system. Everything is gonna get transported around. Every cell in your body has contact with a capillary or a small, at least a small blood vessel. All right, so how does respiration occur? One of the main ways that chemicals, molecules, ions move around our body is through the process of diffusion. The, one of the main principles of diffusion is that atoms move from high concentration to low concentration so that when you have a concentration gradient and you have a membrane, and on one side you have a high amount of something like oxygen, that's in the lungs or in the alveoli, and then your blood vessels are dropping off carbon dioxide, high concentration of carbon dioxide over here, high concentration of oxygen, no, oxygen over here, they're gonna diffuse in opposite directions. So this basic principle, it's kinda like that. Diffusion, diffusion, diffusion. Diffusion is a process that really helps 
many things in our body to get in and out of cells. So get oxygen into the blood when you're breathing, carbon dioxide out. And then you exhale the carbon dioxide out. When you inhale, you bring the oxygen into your lungs. So I know like when I was a little kid, I always thought the, the lungs were just like this structure that was open inside and that they're just filled with oxygen and it would go into the blood and then the carbon dioxide would come out. But really the lungs are relatively solid with microscopic little tiny air pockets in them. Carbon dioxide is going to come out of the blood and oxygen diffuses into the blood. You have this concentration gradient set up to make this a very efficient process. So here again, if this is one of your blood vessels that's surrounding one of the alveoli, when you breathe in, Oxygen is going to be very high in those blood vessels around the alveoli and then it's going to travel through the blood system and it's going to go from high concentration in the blood to low concentration in your cells because your cells are going to have low oxygen because they are constantly moving in that process of cellular respiration. So as soon as oxygen, this high amount of oxygen gets in, it's going to get used up and then carbon dioxide as a product of cellular respiration is going to become very high in the cells and then it's going to be really low in the blood. So it's going to go in and then travel out. Any respiratory system, whether we look at us or we look at a fish or we look at a bird or we look at a worm, they're going to have certain characteristics. We're going to see these three things there. One is, is that that respiratory surface has to be moist. Because oxygen is so tiny, of a molecule, it's going to need some kind of help to get in and out. So that moisture or that water barrier is gonna help that to become more efficient. The tissues have to be thin. So with alveoli sacs, we go from this like large lung structure to these tiny little air sacs, these microscopic air sacs who are covered in tiny microscopic capillaries and so we have those thin surfaces to allow for the oxygen to come through the alveoli and into the blood and carbon dioxide to go from the alveoli and out. I mean, sorry, from the blood to the alveoli and out. There also has to be a large surface area, which means that you have to have tons and tons and tons of these alveoli. You have to have tons of these capillaries. So when we take a look at the smallest structures, the alveoli with the capillaries, what you're going to see if we look at what the larger lung, you're going to see lots of these little kind of like pockets, tons and tons and tons of them, because we have to have a lot of them. Because this is such a critical process to our body for survival. We can tell a lot about the organism and where they evolved from, depending on what their respiratory system looks like. Some organisms are very simple. They don't even have a respiratory system but they have respiratory structures. So let's take a look at, this is a nudibranch or a flatworm, if you remember that from the other day when we talked about excretion, jellyfish, and sponges. All right, so first let's take a look at some organisms, all of these three, that have evolved with no respiratory system but just with respiratory structures. The other thing that we're gonna find is that their shape is going to provide a lot of surface area so that they can do all of this with the external environment's interaction with their own cells or their own bodies. So the first one, the flatworm. The flatworm is very, very flat. And even though it's flat, it's kind of um, wide and long so that it provides adequate surface area for oxygen to diffuse right into the skin. One of the reasons why they've evolved as a benefit to be flat 
is because every cell has to be very close to the surface where oxygen is coming in in order for cells to get oxygen and release carbon dioxide. Jellyfish. So this is really, I think, a fascinating feature of the jellyfish is that the cells on the surface of the jellyfish, the outer cells, have a higher need for oxygen than cells that are embedded deep inside. So the need for metabolism, a higher amount of ATP, you can tell depends on how close they are to the surface or how deep they are in. The deeper you are in, the less you probably do metabolically. And then sponges. So sponges, you can see a lot of holes. What that allows for is it allows for water to flush through the entire organism and so that almost every cell is near the surface because the environment, the water can go in and out, can go inside because of those holes or pores. So I always think that's fascinating. Looking at their structure tells you a bit about their function. Um, in biology, we always use this term form follows function. So looking at something, like I said about like real estate of the different organs and systems tells you a bit about what they do, where they live, how they act. So let's talk a little bit about organisms with respiratory systems. Again, close interaction with a circulatory system. We're going to take a look at a couple of just highlights of very interesting and unique systems in animals. All right, so one is fish. Fish live in water. So instead of using lungs like we do, they use gills. The gills are used for underwater respiration. There's many, many layers of gills. So you can see that. They don't just have like one gill, they have many. And even you can see the filaments or the folds of the gills provide again, extra surface area. Reminds me a little bit about the design of the digestive system with the villi and the microvillae, right? Lots of folding. Size of the gills will tell you a little bit about the amount of oxygen in the water. If you have an organism who has really big gills, it can tell you one of two things. One is it has a really high metabolic need, like sharks have big gills. Sharks typically swim a lot. Or if you have um, an organism that's living in an area where oxygen concentration is really low, that species will have really big gills. So why are gills red? Why do you think? Look at how red they are. Good, I hear a lot of C's. They're red because there's a lot of blood vessels covered in there. Remember, circulatory system is gonna be important for taking oxygen from like the gills, for example, and we'll look at the alveoli in us and bringing that out to the cells and then taking the carbon dioxide back where the carbon dioxide can be released up. So the gills are infused with tons and tons and tons of capillaries, the smallest blood vessels. Regardless of whether being in water or air, you're going to have that connection with the capillaries. Moisture, right, the number one characteristic of a respiratory structure allows for easy diffusion of those gases. Couple other things, um, fish have outer flaps that cover the gills so that if they're swimming in a coral reef and they have to go inside the coral reef and around, you don't want your very important structures to get all banged up by the corals, right? So you can cover those. And there's a cover that as they go through and they swim around, it can brush up against the um, cover of the gills, the operculum. The other thing too is that Fish will often swim with their mouths open, right? It looks cute. They look like they're talking to you. Or, uh, that actually helps them to not only do they, can they get water from the external environment, but because they have these covers on their gills, it's hard for water to get that way, especially if you're swimming this way, right? Water's flowing this way. 
So what you do is you swim with your mouth open or you rest with your mouth open and that pumps water constantly across the gills. It's also a really great feature in terms of oxygen can come across and carbon dioxide can just go back and out. So you don't have necessarily like us that kind of exchange issue where they're coming into the same structure and then that just all has to happen within. Oh, and then the last thing I want to mention is that um, gills are used to being completely covered and moisturized with water. If you take a fish out of water, they will quickly, the thing that usually kills them first is that dehydration of their gills. That moisture surface is taken away and the air is a lot less um, hydrated than water. And so then they'll start to dry out and die. So they essentially suffocate faster. All right, well, let's talk about if you live on land. So like our friend here, the cockroach or other insects, they use what's called a tracheal system. We do have a trachea, that's a little bit similar in some ways and then in other ways, it's really, really different. So we'll take a look at last amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. We're gonna use us as mammals to be represented of all these groups. All right, so insects. Insects have branching tubes. The largest branches are called the trachea. They have more than one trachea, whereas we have one trachea. They do not have a trachea at their mouth. Yeah, it's very different. So they don't have, like for us, the trachea has the epiglottis that can cover it and then food slides down the esophagus. They don't have to worry about that because their trachea are on the sides of their body. So they breathe out of their sides and as they're crawling around, maybe in dirt or dirty environments, they can close off their trachea by closing off these sphericals. And so they can cover up their trachea if they're going through dirt. And it might be dangerous to breathe in dirt. The trachea branch to smaller branches throughout the body called tracheoles. And so then they can make sure that every cell is within diffusing distance of a tracheole and every cell can get an adequate amount of oxygen. If you've ever seen a bug doing this, looks like they're doing little push-ups. They're not doing push-ups, they're actually pumping air in and out. So they're like, <laughs> they're breathing heavy. So if you ever want to, you know, kill a cockroach, just grab them by the sides and hold it for a while. Gross. Anyway. <laughs> Here's what it looks like. They have tracheoles, sorry, they have trachea on the edges of their body. They can be covered up with sphericals. Sphericals can open and close. And then the trachea branch to smaller and smaller branches called tracheoles. And the tracheoles will branch within diffusing distance of all the cells in their body. Look at the mouth. They have some into their antenna, but not right at the mouth itself. Kind of a good function, right? Then you don't have that interference of the respiratory system from the digestive system. All right, so let's take a look at lungs. This I think is really fascinating in terms of our evolution that as fish came onto land and then there were mutations that gave the offshoot of the amphibians and the amphibians still retain some of the characteristics of their fish ancestors because we can see that, that they have two lifestyles. One is their juvenile life is in water, that tadpoles develop in water. They have a tail like a fish. They have lungs in their early life. So we see that evolutionary connection. Adult amphibians, they have lungs, they're primitive lungs. Remember when we talked about evolution, that in terms of respiration, their primitive lungs do not do an efficient job, efficient enough, so that they also have to breathe through their skin. So where you see amphibians, they have to be in a very, very moist environment. You will see them like in tropical rainforests where moisture is very, very high in the air. 
as well as in water itself. All right, so birds and reptiles. They have way more advanced lungs. Birds we're gonna look at in particular because they have a uh, fascinating respiratory system that matches their lifestyle and helps them to fly. It takes a lot of energy to fly, right? If you're flying and flapping your wings and you're holding your body weight, even though they have other mechanisms to make their bodies lighter than our bodies, it still is, if you were constantly moving two large structures on your body, you would need to get a lot of oxygen in. The other thing is that as you go higher up in the atmosphere, the oxygen concentration goes way, way down. So they have some challenges that we do not have. What they have is they have not only lungs, but they have extra air sacs around their lungs to help. The extra air sacs are going to help them get a maximum, maximum, maximum absorption of oxygen, especially as you go higher up in the atmosphere where oxygen concentration is way lower. So they've gotta be really, really efficient about it. So this is, and then also another thing, let me add another fascinating part of it, is their lungs have parabronchi. It looks like a sponge. Again, remember sponges, lots of holes, so they have a lot of surface area. So it just provides extra, extra, extra surface area to allow for, again, maximum infusion of oxygen. And then I think, oh, I don't have that one. But they typically have, you can see like the lungs, extra air sacs, there's you know, other ones here, extra air sacs. Um, look at the amount of real estate the lungs take up in their body. That's a lot. What do you think is gonna also take up a lot of real estate in this body, what system? What goes with respiration? So, re of course, circulatory, but also <coughs> digestion, right? Get the energy in. All right, humans, we have lungs. Look at the real estate it takes up in the top part of our body. So it's really important. We have two parts of our respiration. One is conduction, getting the air in and out of our lungs. And the second is cellular respiration or gas exchange. Or sorry, I should say gas exchange, what leads to supporting cellular respiration. All right, so conduction. Oh, sorry, right, here is the flow of air. So air gets breathed in through your mouth and your nose. It goes to the back of your mouth, which is called the pharynx. It goes down your pharynx into your, uh, past, I should say, past the, Larynx right here, right? If I touch this, my voice goes funny, so I know my voice box is right here. Into the trachea, down the trachea. The trachea is going to branch into two main branches. The reason why it branches into two is because we have a lung on each side. They branch into smaller branches called bronchi, which look like mini trachea or smaller trachea. And then the bronchi branch into even smaller branches called bronchioles, mini, mini trachea, until finally at the end of the bronchioles, you have millions of little air sacs throughout the lungs. So this should kind of tell you, you have some surface area, more surface area, more surface area, and even more surface area. And so lots and lots of surface area for a very important process. So conduction, air's gotta go past these and then come oxygen, carbon dioxide back out. So this is what the circulatory, the respiratory system looks like. Air comes in mouth and nose. Epiglottis will be open, will be open this way. Go down the trachea, branch into the two large bronchi, one for each lung. Bronchi will branch into smaller branches called bronchioles. And when we look at the ends of the bronchioles, you're gonna see millions of these. And this is what an alveoli looks like, or what many alveoli look like. You can see all these little things. So here, if we look at one alveoli, look at how much 
You have blood vessels around them. So let's look at the alveola a little bit more closely to see what's going on. Millions in your lungs. So it really depends on how many millions you have, depends on how big you are. The grasping of those circulatory vessels around each alveoli shows you that direct contact with the circulatory system. Remember that the oxygen is going to come in to the lungs via, sorry, the carbon dioxide is going to come into the lungs via the pulmonary artery. Gas exchange is going to happen around, at, around each alveoli, and then it's going to go out the pulmonary vein back to the left side of the heart. Okay, so I want you to take a look at take a look at this illustration and this illustration. Let's take a look at this illustration specifically. So one of the things here, you can see oxygen is carried on the hemoglobin. We talked about this a little bit before when we talked about the circulatory system. So the hemoglobin carries oxygen. So what is shared in terms of carbon dioxide with the blood? So some of the some of the hemoglobin will carry some carbon dioxide. And then you also have some of it is infused into the lungs as well. So sorry, back to the question that I already had the answer highlighted on, is that the hemoglobin is gonna be important for carrying both carbon dioxide and oxygen and not all the carbon dioxide, it's not a one-to-one -one issue in terms of for everyone car oxygen on hemoglobin is one carbon dioxide. It doesn't work that way because some of it is infused into the blood, um, but, a little bit of carbon dioxide is also carried on the hemoglobin. A lot of people don't realize that. For the previous uh, picture, do you know, David, you know the person from Greece is there? The other one. The person from Greece is there. Do you know that? Can you tell me about this? I'm sorry, I can't hear it. What if, what if you to know about this is that hemoglobin mainly transports in terms of like of oxygen carbon dioxide mainly transports oxygen but also does carry some carbon dioxide back out so that you do have hemoglobin carrying carbon dioxide but you also have some of the carbon dioxide diffused into the plasma in the blood. So that's all I just want you to know, is that carbon dioxide is carried two ways in the blood, whereas oxygen is carried predominantly on the hemoglobin. So just to show you the difference there, okay? All right, so we're gonna talk about a few respiratory issues like carbon monoxide. This is one that you definitely want to think about as we're going into the winter months where you're <coughs> using more um, gas in your home rather than with air conditioning is usually electricity. So what can happen is that your heater can give off carbon monoxide, CO. Carbon monoxide is very toxic. If you have an issue with your heater or your stove at home, it might not burn all the fuel appropriately and then there can be a chemical reaction where it gives off carbon monoxide. So what I would challenge you all to do today is when you go home, make sure that your smoke detector is also a carbon monoxide detector. If it is not, go get a specific smoke detector that also detects carbon monoxide because you cannot smell carbon monoxide. 
And by the time you might know that there is an effect, you could be dead. So things like engines, furnaces, stoves, gas stoves. I know we're getting a lot more electric stoves nowadays. Charcoal grills. Charcoal grills not as dangerous when they're outside, but um, they tell you do not ever use a charcoal grill inside because it will give off carbon monoxide and can kill people. Um, occasionally, engines on boats, if they're not serviced regularly, people who sit in the back, they might absorb too much carbon monoxide and they go in the water and they swim and they drown because they have that carbon monoxide poisoning. And so boat engines, if you have a boat or know someone has a boat, you gotta get that serviced regularly. In Texas last year when it was like snowing, a lot of people died from this because they weren't aware of it and they had their uh, cars in their garage done. Did you see that in the news? I, I, I like didn't, no. A few families died from it because they, did, they didn't know. And they're down in Texas, why would it be cold? They don't have heaters. Right, oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's awful. Cigarettes give off some carbon monoxide, so we smoke a lot. It's good to be in a place like go smoke outside as opposed to inside. Carbon monoxide binds to the same sites on hemoglobin, so this is why I wanted to emphasize that carbon monoxide can be carried on hemoglobin because they're going to bind and they're gonna stay. So when those red blood cells come back around and into the lungs to release carbon, carbon dioxide, well, in some of their places of binding, if they have carbon monoxide, the carbon monoxide doesn't let go and you can't exhale it, so it just hangs on there. So what the carbon monoxide, as you're more exposed to it, you have more binding on the hemoglobin sites that are going to bind oxygen, but if those are already taken, the amount of oxygen you can bind goes down over time, and then you essentially suffocate in your cells. It can stick. So think about after 200 times of rotating through your lungs, they might eventually let go. For several hours, it might take for one of them to finally let go and allow more oxygen in. So yeah, Haley, I can see where, you know, if you, you're like, let's go sit in the car in the garage and be warm. You're in there for a few hours and then all that carbon monoxide builds up inside of the garage. And what it does is it makes you sleepy and they might've been thinking, oh, I'm just so warm and cozy. And then you go to sleep and you're actually suffocating. So, oh, I went the wrong way. Okay, so about for several hours, um, I talked about that, that, that. You only need as little as 0.1% carbon monoxide present to suffer from this. What you will usually see is the lips will turn blue because of the lack of oxygen, and it'll be apparent in places that are close to the surface area, your capillaries, and then your nail beds as well you'll see blue nail beds. And so then you're like, oh, something's weird here. So it's typically very hard to detect. It just makes you like sleepy. Okay. So things, so make sure when you go home, check your, check your smoke detectors and invest. It's just usually they're almost about the same price now. They're pretty inexpensive these days, but make sure, and especially you want them um, one in your kitchen, near your, if you have a gas stove, you definitely want one in your kitchen, and you want one wherever you have your heater. You want it near the heater, and then also near, you know, like every level, definitely. Like if you have a two-story home and your furnace is in the basement, you want one in the basement closer to the furnace, and then you want one in the kitchen, and you want one on that second level, because right when you burn, your furnace burns, it gives off air, to your whole house. So at least one on every level. Um, it's kind of good to have one outside every sleeping room, like one around it. Isn't carbon monoxide also heavier, denser than regular air? I don't I don't know about the density. I, I, if if I, you have read that, then I would. Yeah, I thought I've heard it is. So if you have it in the basement, if someone's sleeping in the basement, then for sure have a carbon monoxide detector. Good, very good. Okay, so it sinks yeah. more because it's heavier. 
yeah, so definitely you want one on every, they always say on every level and closer to the kitchen and the sleeping rooms. Thank you. All right, so how do we actually breathe? There's a couple structures that we looked at during dissection and on the torso that are important. We didn't really look at the rib muscles, um, but if you have ever eaten ribs, what ribs are are the muscles between the ribs that you're eating off of either a pig or a cow. So there's a lot of muscle that hold the bones in their shape. The diaphragm, remember the diaphragm is below the lungs and on top of essentially the liver and the stomach over here. So when you inhale, air is drawn in. The lungs are tied to the pleural cavity, so the outer cavity of your lungs. The diaphragm contracts and the ribs contract. And when they contract, what they do, and you can feel this if you put your hands like on your back and you take a big breath, you can feel the movement. What happens is, is the diaphragm contracts and it goes down. So it's, it has connective tissue that connects to the bottom of the lungs. And so it physically pulls the lungs down, making them elongate. And you can feel your ribs, they go out. Your rib cage gets bigger. So that, um, again, connective tissue is tied between the ribs and each of the lungs. And so it pulls the lungs out. So you've got your lungs that are expanding this way and this way. And that helps to bring in an additional amount of air. That's why if you're anxious, what do they always tell you? Take a deep breath, right? More oxygen gets into your body and your efficient processes happen better and so that you can be more relaxed. So you breathe in, you breathe out. The ribs come in, they relax, so they go back into place and they relax. The diaphragm goes back into place and it relaxes. So what they physically do, the ribs and the diaphragm, is they're basically like squishing the lungs and pushing air out. So again, for that anxiety, you're getting a lot more oxygen in and you're getting a lot more carbon dioxide out. This is what we call passive activity because you're, you're relaxing your muscles, or the, I shouldn't say you are, your muscles are relaxing. And so they're naturally just forcing the air out. Sorry. So I like this diagram because you can just kind of upon glance see that when you breathe in, everything gets bigger. Look at the position of the diaphragm when it's contracted. Look at how big the ribs have moved apart too. You can see they get smaller and the diaphragm goes up. Has anyone had to do the Heimlich maneuver on anyone else? No, nope. I've had to do it twice in my life. Um, so it's a good thing to know. So the epiglottis, remember that when you, your trachea, which is in the front, your esophagus is in the back, when you eat or drink, the epiglottis goes like this. If you ever have that moment where you drink something and you cough right away, it means something before your epiglottis closed, something got into your trachea, the cilia on your trachea vibrate and they usually expel it. However, if whatever you're eating, like a big, let's say you have a, a tomato, a cherry tomato, right? And it's this big and you like, just for whatever reason, you swallow it accidentally. Someone scares you and you go, <gasps> and you have that in your mouth and it goes, down your trachea before the epiglottis closes, it can get lodged in there. And your body might not be able to cough it out. It's too big, it gets stuck. So you need some assistance. You need somebody to take the lungs and the diaphragm and make them smaller and smaller, make that lung area smaller so that it can take any air that was in the lungs and use it to push out whatever's stuck in the trachea. Oh, that epiglottis. Sometimes I say, well, the epiglottis is slow, occasionally. And you need to get it out because otherwise, again, if it's blocked, it's blocking that whole system of getting oxygen 
into your lungs, into the alveoli, diffusing into the blood, getting carbon dioxide out. So the Heimlich maneuver is going to forcefully take the air, whatever was in there, and try and use that to push it out. One time I did this, I was waitressing at a restaurant in college and I saw this baby was turning blue and the mom was not paying attention at all. She was with her friend and I just went over and babies you have to do differently. The Heimlich is typically, I'll show you, it's typically like you want to hit here where the bottom of the diaphragm is and push up. So you're helping the push up on the diaphragm to push up on the lungs. But with babies, you have to turn them over and put them so that their head is like right here and you're supporting them on your arm. And then you do this, you give them like a uh, 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 that way. Um, and so I saw it, grabbed her baby, did that. She's screaming at me. What are you doing to my baby? And I'm just like, she's like grasping at me. And then the baby, something popped out. I gave her her baby and she was like, I'm gonna sue you. I'm like, go ahead, sue me for saving your child. And then my manager was like, go stay in the bath for a while. She's really mad. She's screaming out there. I'm like, I just saved her baby. He's like, I know. Well, that was weird. Weird, weird, weird. All right, so um, this guy looks really serious about doing the homework. So again, if it's an adult, you're going to put your fist like this, you want to typically put your thumb out. I mean, you certainly don't want to be like, mm, mm, mm. you just like start. And it's at the belly button, just above, so I say just above the belly button, and it's an upward motion. If you're ever choking and you're alone, you basically just want to find a sharp corner and start like jamming yourself on it um, so that it will, that motion will help to squeeze the lungs so the air can be used to push out that object. All right, last thing I want to talk about is smoking. Um, I feel like smoking is getting a lot less popular, but we have that whole, and you guys are doing the discussion of vaping, or you did that assignment, I should say, that vaping is getting a lot more popular, which has similar yet different awful things that are done to the body. So lots and lots of people die of diseases that are related to smoking, and you can see that there's lots of them. Um, a lot of them are directly related to the respiratory system and the circulatory system, um, lung cancer. There's some lung cancers, though, that can be found in people who have never smoked before. Emphysema, we'll talk a little bit about that, just like your um, emphysema and bronchitis, the alveoli get brittle from exposure to the dry smoke and the toxic chemicals over time. Heart disease, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Stroke, we'll talk more about that. And then also there's other cancers that can be accelerated by all these toxins in your body as well. All right, so let's talk about all the things that smoking does to your body. Not just the lungs, but the body. So it can paralyze the cilia. Because it'll paralyze the cilia, because when things drop into your trachea, your body doesn't feel it because the cilia are just like not functioning. So a virus particle, a flu particle can get in there and normally what would happen, or not always, but more often in healthy people, you, your cilia would be like, ooh, something there. And then you cough and you have a better chance of not getting the flu or the common cold or even COVID, for example, because your cilia are vibrating. Other things can just drop into your lungs too, which is not healthy as well. There's at least 200 toxins in cigarette smoke, of which at least a dozen are known carcinogens, meaning that they cause cancer. The smoke also makes the white blood cells less efficient. So not only the cilia part 
of your immune system is affected, but also your main warriors are affected. In response to the dry smoke and the toxins, your lungs produce more mucus. What happens when you have a lot of mucus in your lungs? You breathe heavier. So a lot heavier, harder breathing. Harder for gas exchange to occur if you have a lot of mucus, um, not just in the winter time, in the summertime, in the fall, in the spring, is that you've got that extra mucus. That's why some people that smokers cough is because people who smoke for a long time, they get that, <laughs> that weird cough that they do. Particles in the smoke, right? You see the ashes, they're black. Well, some of those go into your lungs and actually start to cause the tissues to turn black. So pathologists, can look at cause of death on people. And one of the things, if it's not directly related to smoking, they might look at the lungs and they will see black lungs. And I'll show you pictures of that soon too. Bronchitis can lead to infections within your lungs. That can happen regularly. If you get regular bronchitis in the winter, a lot of times it's just that sensitivity to the cold air can cause infections in your alveoli, cause them to become more brittle. Um, but regular smoking can do that. Um, I used to run six miles a day, every day, no matter what the weather was. And in the winter when it was like really cold, I would get bronchitis because, you know, 20 year old me was like, I gotta go get my run in. And that cold air was really bad for my lungs. Emphysema can occur when the toxins in the cigarette smoke build up over time, can cause your alveoli to get thinner and thinner and drier and more brittle and hard and they'll actually break. So here you're interfering with cellular respiration because you don't have as many alveoli anymore. Carbon monoxide we talked about there's carbon monoxide is one of the many toxins, which causes, again, less ability of oxygen to bind because the carbon monoxide is taking up that space on the hemoglobin. The toxins actually promote atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries. They promote when you eat LDL cholesterol to get put underneath the walls of your arteries. Smokers, look at this statistic. Smokers are 70% more likely to die of heart disease than if they didn't smoke. That's huge. Because your immune system is malfunctioning, right? Your white blood cells. They can't heal you as fast. So anytime you have an infection, a broken bone, some kind of issue that your white blood cells would come and do a cleanup, they're not gonna work as well. So everything takes longer to heal. Wrinkly, people get real wrinkly from smoking. The toxins affect the skin. So aesthetically, they might be older than they actually are. Because the alveoli can rupture, people get what's called Swiss cheese lungs. And you can see all kinds of ruptures. This is a healthy lung. Look at all these little dots. Each one of these little dots is a healthy alveoli. And here, look at the spacing, the alveoli. There's a lot more spacing between alveoli and even like huge pockets that the alveoli have just burst open. This is a healthy lung. Certainly some toxins get in throughout your life, right? But not like this. Their lungs actually turn black. 